Hey guys, today I'll be reviewing the new units and ARs that have released for the current Valentine Time Slip event. So first off we have Snow, a 5 star Ether Thrust unit. Snow is a simple to understand unit, being a unit who primarily hits hard through his charge, while also building his charge quickly. On turn 1, you will have his charge ready, which when activated bestows himself concentration and combo. On every second turn, he has a high chance of attacking with crit whose activation chance is bolstered by the aforementioned charge buffs. Every time he hits a unit, and every turn start, he gains even more CP. He should reliably get at least 70 CP as long as he hits one unit every turn, making it possible to have him alternate every turn between a crit bolstered regular attack and a charge. He is also able to remove all buffs from an enemy on regular attack every three turns, which can prevent lethal counterattacks in case he fails to build his charge by turn three. He has a minor ability of protecting himself and an ally with nullify debuff to self and a somewhat large heal to the ally behind him every time he moves. Because of this, he would pair well with a unit that can support from behind without having to move. Christmas Claude is a natural choice, giving Snow the friendship and glint activation rate buffs, additional CP to help achieve charge crit alternation, and more damage buffs such as Vigor and Ardor. Next up we have Barghest, a 4 star fire slash unit. Vargas's most obvious feature is having three damage attenuating statuses at his disposal. Tenacity to self and allies behind him before damage, protection to self and allies adjacent to him on move, and curse on enemies struck or after striking. His 3x2 pull in on move is incredibly helpful, bringing units in range for him and other short range allies to attack. His taunt on move is also quite exploitable, and a lot safer than the way Alp uses it, due to the three consistently applied damage attenuating statuses. Because of the aforementioned taunt, protection, and tenacity, in addition to regeneration on phase start, Vargas gains his charge quite quickly with a CP gain on buff skill effect. Because of this, even though his regular attack is fairly weak, Vargas has a decent damage rate with regular charges every 3 or 4 turns. Lastly, he has a pretty niche ability of applying guts to allies nearby when he's removed from battle. This would be useful for challenge quests where widespread team wipes are unavoidable such as from an enemy's severe HP depletion skill effect. The next unit is Gumao, a 4 star nether magic range unit. Gumao functions a bit like Jiangxi Babylon, acting as both a minor CP battery and a damage amplifier. He applies nourishment to allies nearby and limit to allies in front of and behind him on move, granting allies a damage multiplier of 3 to 6. He also applies acceleration to self and allies adjacent on move. Unlike Babylon, however, he enhances rather than restricts team mobility, with his extended horizontal movement well complementing his majority on move skill effects. His kit is also centered around healing, although the healing itself is rather paltry. Nourishment and small flat heal on move to allies, as well as a flat heal from his quick to build charge, restores a decent chunk of team HP but is negligibly helpful to patching up major damage due to the lack of complementary damage attenuating abilities. However, his ability to oppress enemies at a reliable rate and wide range of magic may somewhat complement his healing role, enabling heal stall strategies. Pair him up with any unit that you would with Jiangxi Babylon, that is to say, units with good charges that can hit hard and don't need to move. These include Valentine Snow and Heracles 5. Next up, we have the permanent nether unit Heracles, whose 3 is non range and whose 5 is shot range. Heracles acts as a charge clock, being able to gain 100 CP and release his lethal charge at shot range every 4 turns. The trade off for this lethality is being given a huge disincentive to move, inflicting several debuffs to himself when he does. Besides the restriction of intentionally not moving him, he is actually a rather simple to use unit. His 3 acts as a support to the unit in front of him, giving the classical 3-fold aid of a defense buff, HP restoration, and CP increase. His 5 acts as an insanely stacked damage dealer, having brawn, vigor, and weakness at his disposal for non-charge turns, and brawn, vigor, crit double plus, limit, and rage plus during his charge gain turn. And unlike his 3, his 5 doesn't self-inflict CS lock on move, and thus, you can choose to move him on his charge gain turn, where all his subsequent debuffs would immediately be removed by the charge itself. Overall, you can boil him down as a unit that you shouldn't move, whose 3 would help the unit in front of him, and whose 5 deletes units with ease. Pair him up with any unit who benefits from acting as his fairy, and with any unit that are naturally good fairies. 
The last feature unit on the banner is Echo, a wood blow unit. Echo functions a lot like Alp, a wide range debuff unit that can only act out the role after turn 1. Unlike Alp, she inflicts oppression or fear, depending on her rarity, and weakness at a somewhat reliable rate. Gaining her weapon type change status requires getting hit, and her main mitigation against that first triggering hit is guts and a sizable self heal every 2 turns. Her 4 also acts as a CP battery for adjacent allies for every enemy she hits. Although she also features some on miss skill effects for the turns she doesn't have weapon change up, they are quite underwhelming. Thus, she'll only be effective for a maximum of 2 turns every 3 turns, with her regular weapon type turn generally only being used for letting her get hit again. She is best used in large maps with many enemies, preferably clustered together to take advantage of her charged possession effect. Place her in the leader slot to take advantage of weakness with later slotted units attacking. And now for the ARs. We have the 5 star Hakenchi AR, translated as Valentine Dogs, which bestows face start, guts, and CP once struck. It is restricted to Moritaka, Tatomo fire units, and other units. This AR combines Mountain Dweller and Berserker, but with lower rates and values. It would equip well with units that are quick to perish and that benefit from getting hit. I would specifically recommend Behemoth, who has a unit that wants to be hit to build his charge faster, but paradoxically has no damage attenuating mechanisms in his kit. The extra CP would help ready his charge even faster, and Guts would prevent defeat before reaching his charge. Next we have the 4 star AR, translated as Chocolate from the Abyss. It can remove charm at a 50% rate, and confers curse advantage. It is restricted to Shiro, Citri, Fire Units, and Nether Units. This is the second AR to confer Curse Advantage, and add a slightly higher multiplier at that. This AR confers a 1.6 damage multiplier, compared to the 1.4 times multiplier of the Agio Moritaka Armor Race AR. The Charm Resistance is mostly a bonus, and isn't something to be relied on given the abysmal stirring rate of 50% removal. Equip this card to anyone who can inflict Curse, particularly anyone who already deals decent damage. Valentine Vargas would equip this card well since he can inflict curse on attack and naturally has curse advantage. Regular Chernobog, regular Bathine, and Babylon 5 would also work due to their natural strength and curse on attack. The second 4 star AR is translated as Those Days When I Was Wild. It bestows CP every 2 turns and confers blow resistance. And it is restricted to Kengo, C3, E3 units, and blow units. This card guarantees at least 8 CP every 2 turns, making it well suited for units who have a good charge, but don't build it very quickly. Examples are numerous, but these include Echo, regular Amatsumara, and Makan 4. The blow resistance is a bonus that would be useful in some niche uses. This resistance can be stacked with a natural blow resistance of Jacob, Licho, Kagutsushi 3, or regular Wakan Tanko 5. And lastly, in the AR gacha, we have the 3 star Chocolate Dynamite. This card heals adjacent allies every time the equipping card is moved, and it also confers long slash resistance. It is restricted to Choji, Abisu, Magic Units, and Snipe Units. This card enables healing adjacent allies on move. Because of how paltry the heal is, it would end up being noticeably useful only in situations where you can stall indefinitely. It doesn't quite matter who you equip this card on, and in fact the other members of your team would matter more. If your team is unable to stall, then this card would be negligibly useful. This is the first optimal means of long slash resistance, although generally long slash damage isn't a problem, and the 0.8 times resistance multiplier isn't that great either. Thus, you can expect never finding a time to intentionally use this feature. The last AR I'll be discussing is not a part of the Valentine event, but rather something that was released near it and it is the 2 star AR Shard of the Far Off Lightning Warrior, which is obtainable in the new dungeon, the Ikebukuro Underground Labyrinth. It confers Paralysis removal, and it is restricted to E3 units. Paralysis is generally not an issue to face, and if it does occur, then everyone would equally benefit from having resistance to it. Thus, for general use, you would more likely use this card for an easy additional 400 attack. The Anniversary AR confers more and is less restrictive, 
So you'd want to use this attack only if another member already has the Anniversary AR equipped. And that ends my analysis of the Valentine Time Slip units. I hope this was useful for some of you. I was a bit ready to be redundant to the stream I posted before, but I think it turned out alright. And it does keep me busy doing something at least. <laughs> well, that's it. Hope you enjoy the rest of the event. I'll see you around.